It's lit the way on airport landing strips in emergencies, operating rooms in World War II, and even helped guide archaeologists into the deepest caves. The classic Coleman Lantern has been part of many a wonderful journey. Coleman Lantern was always there. It was the, it was the sunshine of the night for us then. Uh, I'm still able to have that uh, lantern today, so it's uh, great memories of my youth. I have lots of fond memories of camping with my family and being at the lake and using Coleman stoves and lanterns. And my dad still has the Coleman Lantern that we used, you know, 30 years ago. Lantern collectors clubs have sprung up all over the world where people gather for what they call light-ups. We just had one two years ago here in Wichita where uh, we basically did a 42 foot tall, 21 foot wide replica of a Coleman lantern and it was outlined in lanterns, the oldest one being a 1914 arc lantern. The Coleman lantern was born out of necessity in the late 1890s when a school teacher and typewriter salesman named W.C. Coleman was trying to read one night. He loved to read, but he had poor eyesight. He was sitting in his hotel room reading one evening and saw this bright light coming from an apothecary store across the street. He was so amazed by it. He went over, he looked at the light, and saw that it was a pressure-fed lamp. It had a bright glow and used a mantle to, to achieve that light. That was called the Irby Gillian Lamp. It made such an impression on Coleman, he hit the road to Tennessee, where that lamp was made. So he journeyed to Tennessee, met with the Irby Gillian Company, bought all the lamps he could, and he ventured out trying to sell lanterns. Even though electricity was spreading across the country, Coleman had faith in the lamp. In fact, he bought the company, moved it to Wichita, Kansas, and it became the Coleman Lamp Company. W.C. was very hands-on with his lanterns, improving and refining them. And in 1914, he introduced the Arc Lantern. It helped farmers and tradespeople extend their working days. Lanterns, you got to understand at this point in time, were more of a tool or utilitarian use versus a uh, recreational use. Then, during World War II, Coleman made a lantern for the U.S. Army. They did a lot to light the camps. It provided light for operations and operating rooms. And there were many, many uses uh, for the Coleman Lantern during World War II. But at that point in time, there were no generators, no power or whatever. After the war, Coleman's recreational business exploded as Americans started exploring their own national parks. Today, they still make the classic two-mantle lantern here in Wichita, Kansas, where it all began in 1901. We can produce 1,500 lanterns a day uh, in an eight-hour shift. It starts with coiled steel, where it's going to be stamped. The steel is stamped into discs. Some will form the base of the lantern, and others the fuel tank, or what's called the fount. Then on a ram press, the discs get stamped into shape. Holes are cut into the founts, where the pump and valve will go. The pump barrel is inserted along with an air stem wire, which will keep the air separate from the fuel. The bottoms are crimped to the fuel tanks on this turntable, and then they head to the furnace, where they will be joined permanently. We put copper rings anywhere where there'll be a seal or a metal-to-metal -metal contact. We'll put either a ring or a paste that is 85% copper. The founts pass through a curtain of fire on their way to the furnace. It's uh, about uh, 2,100 degrees hot. Uh, it has no oxygen in there, so that what happens is it goes in and heats up to red hot, and that copper then just flows into, into those different joints. The most important part of the lantern is the mantle, those small fabric sacks that emit an extremely bright light. The mantle has been around since the late 1800s. The mantle is, is the uh, light bulb for the lantern, of course. Uh, it really is uh, kind of kind of a magic I've, as far as I, I'm concerned. What we're doing is we're taking a, a rayon and we're uh, weaving that in, into a sock. This knitting machine has three spools, 90 needles, and spins at about 500 revolutions a minute. In eight hours, they can make 30,000 mantles here. The knitted mantle tubes are dunked in a vat, which contains, among other secret ingredients, a rare earth element called yttrium. What's uh, very interesting about that mantle is, is when you're burning it, you're not really burning anything to do with, with the uh, rayon. All you're doing is you're lighting that mantle and just turning that into an ash. The heat from the mantle actually causes the rare earth items in there to glow. 
that white glow is your light bulb. That's, that is what uh, the lantern's all about. The tubes are dried thoroughly and steamed flat. Then they're cut to length, hemmed, and drawstringed. Finally, they're stamped and packaged. Meanwhile, after the founts or fuel tanks emerge from the furnace, the check valves are put in. Check valves allow air to flow into the fount, but not back out, which is how you build pressure when you're pumping. From there, we're going to do 100% check to make sure that all the uh, joining surfaces are sealed and it is a pressure vessel. The founts are submersed in water to check for any bubbling that would indicate a leak. Every hour, they take a few of the founts and destroy them to see just how much pressure they can withstand. We're going to put it under pressure until it bursts and make sure that we have enough uh, strength there in the steel and all the joints and everything are good before it moves on to the consumer. Once they're pressure tight, the inner surfaces can be coated. We're going to take an epoxy and we're going to mist the inside of the fount. What that does is we're going to coat all of the internal metal uh, surfaces and by doing that it stops any corrosion. Now they're ready for that classic Coleman green. You know, that's a legacy that goes back forever. There's been a few different shades of green through the years, but it's always been Coleman green. The founts are placed on hangers and enter the paint booth. We're going to negatively charge the part, and the paint we're going to positively charge. And it's going to go through a booth where it's spraying out a fine mist of paint. That positively charged paint is going to be attracted to that negatively charged part, and that's going to bond to it and adhere to it. Then it's up into the oven where the paint bakes on at 325 degrees for about 25 minutes. Now everything's ready for the assembly line where the founts will finally meet their fuel trains which convey pressurized fuel to the mantles. We're going to crack open the check valve, uh, then we're going to add a decal and we're also going to put in the uh, pump. We're going to add that fuel train, we're going to spin that into the top of the, of the fount. From there they do one more dunk test to make sure the valve is pressure tight. The collars go on, the burner tubes, heat shields, and finally the glass globes, protected by styrofoam. At the packout station, we'll be putting the lantern in the box, as well as instructions, mantles, uh, the uh, ventilator, and the bale assembly. And then uh, closing that up and packing it out and shipping to the customer. Whether that customer is a die-hard adventurer or a relaxed cottager, the people at Coleman know their lanterns aren't the main event. They're there to add to the experience whatever it may be. When you have people that are gatherings, it's outdoors, it's together, it's just creating memories. And creating memories, I think, is what this has all been about.